Hi, I'm Helen Fretter, editor of Yachting World, and we're continuing our series looking at the latest generation America's Cup designs ahead of racing in the Barcelona this October. We're looking at the latest AC75s as they're launched with, together with Thomas Tison, a naval architect and yacht designer who's worked with four America's Cup challengers in this cycle with Ineos Britannia. And today we're going to look at the British Challengers boats. Uh, they've co codenamed RB3. Every British America's Cup boat comes with a huge weight of expectation. It's 173 years ago since the first America's Cup was held, right here, I'm in Cowes, and we've never won it. Every modern America's Cup team has its difficulties to overcome. But there's no denying that this British team seems to be in a really strong place with a lot of consistency and cumulative learning behind it. It's the third team uh, headed up by Sir Bell Ainsley. It's the second fully funded team by Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos. And they're coming into it as challengers record. There's been a long-term commitment to this America's Cup. But there are things that are different this time. And a huge part of it is their collaboration with uh, Mercedes AMG Petronas F1 team. They're not the only team that has a really strong F1 connection, but it is perhaps the team that has gone all in in bringing together sailing and motorsport. So what can we see of that in the launch of RB3, Thomas? Well, it was, um, I think the, the idea behind was to be able to use the engineering capacities of, of Mercedes Formula One. So early on, like when we joined the team and the team was created, there, there was this core group of um, America's Cup designers, and we were sent to, to Brackley, uh, where Mercedes Formula One is. And the idea was to have the two sort of groups uh, working together. And so the America's Cup um, designers could, um, you know, direct and sort of imagine the future and bring the experience. And then Mercedes Formula One could bring um, their processes, their engineering capacities, and, and so on, and try and get the two to work together. And what's it like having a very early conversation about where you're ex explaining what an America's Cup boat needs to do compared to what an F1 car needs to do? Yeah, and I think, you know, for the anecdote is when, when we arrived, we had to um, create documents to explain what the main soul is and, 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 you know, what is important from a performance point of view. And there are many similarities between the two. They are both driven by fluids, by structure, by reliability, and, and broadly, we use the same tools, uh, but there are also many differences um, in terms of, you know, we have the water, obviously, and, and uh, so this, is, this, this was the challenge for us. It, it does really look like there's been a strong F1 influence there. There's a lot of crazy shapes and curves going on. Um, is that all coming from F1? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of uh, the geometry that comes from from F1. And if we look at it, broadly speaking, um, the, the the concept is like the previous America's Cup pod. So you have the two cockpit pods, the, the end plating of the main sole and the, the bar sole, the hull extension to the water. Um, but then when you look at the geometry um, in the air, I think this is where uh, you can really see the influence of Formula One, and and they use tools that that previously we didn't have access to. Um, so you can see, for instance, around the foil area, um, the way the detailed geometry is, is optimized is quite reminiscent to to Formula One team, um, and this also can be seen, uh, for instance, around the around the rudder um, area. That's a suspension system uh and that's an aero foiling going on presumably controlling some steering systems at the back of uh the new ac75 yeah and i think what looking at the picture of ineos um so it's one of the team that has an external uh structure above the deck for the rudder uh, team new zealand don't have it but american magic have it and and i think looking at it you know it has this airfoil uh, geometry around and it's quite reminiscent to what we see on the Formula One suspension system, for instance, and where on Formula One they sometimes have the structure which is then covered by um, geometry that you can control from an aerodynamic point of view. 
presumably when you're bringing in f1 teams then you have people with really different levels of expertise um whereas sailing teams i guess tend to be more compact um how do those all those different areas merge yeah and i think that's that's was really uh the the aspect is when we look at it and uh, typically uh, the design team of an america's cup team is around 20 people and and you know it's hard to say exactly how many we were but uh, you know probably around 100 people and and so this is where we had to uh organize the the design team and to to make the best of it and so we had different departments we had um we divided the design basically in different areas to make the best of it and what did the um what do the f1 designers have that as a as a yacht designer would be a new tool or something you'd not worked with to that level before yeah i think in broadly speaking we have the same tools so we we use 3d cards and we use fea to simulate the structure but there are tools in terms of aerodynamics that we didn't have before and so if we look back at, at the evolution of the tools um we had the sort of uh, wind tunnels or towing tank where you would build a model you would put it in a towing tank and you would get um the sort of drag and lift for the boat but without details of the flow then we moved to cfd uh, which is a computing system and we could finally visualize the flow and i think now we're on the next phase and and this is a great tool i think where what they have is a tool where it gives you a visualization of the flow but it also tells you how to change the geometry um, and so looking at, at a detail on the boat, for instance, it would show you uh, that this radius perhaps is too sharp or too blunt and, and then can automatically iterate on the geometry. And I think that's clearly something I would want to, to use for the, for the designs. Yeah. So with these new tools, I guess that's where you see these huge design hours uh, that the teams talk about before the launch of each of these boats. Oh yes, totally, and and I think that's that's also what I something I want people to 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 see, and I think is interesting, is that um, if you think about a normal yacht design project, the the design is a fraction um, of the cost of the build, um, but in the America step we have found over the years that the design is multiple times uh, the the cost of the build, and and so these design projects are. You know, the budgets, of course, are important in the America's Cup, but such a large part is spent in design that it allows us to analyze and go in the details um, that cannot be done even on the, on the superior design, for instance. Does that have a trickle-down effect? Will some of those tools and, and things you've learned? Yeah, I think, I think we always see it. And, and for instance, in this America's Cup, uh, we have removed the backstays. And so we're we're learning about the, the the sort of interface between the sail and the mast, and how the sail contributes to stiffening the mast in a way. And in the future, so we're developing tools for this. And I can imagine that in the future, the super yacht masts, for instance, will will improve thanks to this. So let's have a look at the boat itself then. Um, and so we've talked a little bit about the some of those aero shapes, but then uh, underneath the hull, we've got another one of these bustle running into a skeg arrangements. This one mm. stops earlier um, than some of its some of the other boats we've seen, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's it's an area where it's difficult to answer for me, but um, I think what we can what we can say is that we are always trying to reduce with its surface area, and there's a there's some kind of optimum to find between um, the hydrodynamics, uh, which you can improve by reducing weighted surface area, and the aerodynamics where we're trying to end play the main sole against the water and close this gap. And um, so I think it's a, it's a neat solution. Um, of course, the drawback potentially is that the rudder um, is, is longer, um, but, but it's, a, it's a good solution. So without pushing you on trade secrets then, um, the other thing we can start to see in this image then is the foils. So Ineos Britannia launched with um, 
second generation foils, as in latest generation foils, didn't they? Some of the other boats launched with uh, what they call legacy foils. So basically from the last time around or from uh, early trials, aren't they? Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's going on with foil design then in this cycle? Yeah, I think it's, um, it's interesting because in the previous America's Cup, um, the full concept was new. And so to reduce the cost and increase reliability, was decided that the vertical part of the foil, which is this curved uh, part, would be common to all the racing teams. And so this part is still the same as the America's Cup from um, the last cycle. Um, and what the teams are working with now is to design the horizontal part of the foil. And so essentially you have this vertical part that, that can rotate up and down. And this allows to sort of adjust how much of the lift is created vertically or horizontally. And then the horizontal part itself is created to um, generate the lift uh, for the boat itself. So the areas that they can affect this time around then are within that, that green box effectively. That's where they can make a competitive difference. Yeah, exactly. And and so we're trying to gain an edge and this is the area where creativity can make a difference. And so the teams are essentially there are two main options is either to extend the vertical part down and have kind of a horizontal uh, straight foil or go perhaps more diagonally. And so this is what we're seeing at the moment is the result of the optimization process of every team who are trying to find the right balance between sort of um, weighted surface area, um, which is part of the drag, and the aspect ratio of the horizontal foil, which drives another part of the drag. So it's not just the complexity of the shape, but the actual control systems within that. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it goes down to even the, the kind of uh, steel that we are using and, and knowledge of the loads. So uh, yeah, the amount of work that goes uh, in the pack is, is, is quite astonishing. Really. So these are RB3's uh, foils that she was launched with right from the outset, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And and we can see, for instance, that on the vertical part, there are, the vertical part is not creating too much lift. And so all the teams are trying to uh, sort of cut pieces of it to reduce weighted surface area. And so we see variations around the theme. And the horizontal part on the other side is creating lift. And it's mainly driven by how long and narrow the foil is. And so to make it longer, they are creating winglets. Um, to adjust lift, they are creating trim tabs. And you have to imagine that inside the foil itself, there is a system that allows uh, the flaps to move up and down and potentially different on, on each side. And so it's a very detailed and intricate um, engineering process. And of the new generation foils you've seen so far, is there consensus or are there still quite a lot of variations? Um, I think we, we see a consensus at the moment to have um, an almost straight hinge line, which is at around 40% of the cord. Um, and and the foil shape, which is slightly angled down so that when it's loaded up, the, the, the foil itself becomes a little bit longer, potentially it goes outside of the box um, and gaining performance. I think that's, that's a kind of foil that we know works well. So when you say it goes outside the box, so the pressures on the foil literally flatten it out and make it longer than its measured length. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And we've we've seen RB3 uh, in test sail mode quite a bit now. They've they've had quite a bit of time on the water with her, um, and certainly seems to be putting down some pretty high speed runs already. She seems to fly quite low to the water. Is that optimal? Um, yes, I think in in theory, if the water is very flat, you really want to be uh, kissing the water. So not touching it, but really closing the gap with the water as much as possible. And, and so if we see Neos doing this, I think that's a, that's a, good, a good sign.
Yeah, I think the, the bow down has different aspects is as you put the bow down, the sort of rig moves forward in a way relative to the foils. And so you're adapting um, the equilibrium of the boat to make it more tender or more you know, stiffer into the wind. That's the first aspect. And then the second aspect is uh, changing the angle of attack on the rudder. So you're sort of unloading the rudder and loading more the main foil, which is, um, you know, you really want to load the main foil as much as possible in, in the breeze, because that's where uh, the writing moment comes from. Several people have commented that it looks like quite a muscular design, um, even quite sort of quite powerful, maybe even a little bit on the brutal side. Um, but in flight, it seems quite graceful. Is that your perspective? Yeah, I think it, I think it looks purposeful. I would say, and and of course, it's it's a boat that is that is quite um, you know the lines are very tensed. Um, some people have spotted that the mast. Ball, um is is at deck level, so it, it implies that the boat has a lot of volume. Um, but I think in the end it, it can work, and and you know given the analysis we've done, um, you know it's a boat that should work and and looks to be in line with Team New Zealand. Um, now I think the question is, um, you know we have this habit of thinking that the big boats um, from Imo cars and so on are the fast boats. But does it apply to uh, an American casket boat? Uh, this is something we will have to see. So the 173-year question then, can this one win the America's Cup? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> and I want to. I mean, of course, like, you know, when you work for, for a team, you really want them to, to win. And, and, and I think it can. It's, it's a long process because the design creates the potential then the builder, they really have to, you know, do the best work they can uh, to to reach the level of quality. And then the sailors also have to to use the tool as best as possible. And so it's a long chain, and it also depends on the weather conditions. But I think the potential is there, really. Awesome. Well, we hope so too. Thank you ever so much, Thomas. We'll speak again soon. Thank you, Elaine. Mm -hmm.